This is Sonia Wagner representing PCA families in one of our recordings that capture lived experience and best practice evidence-based learning that assists kinship, permanent and adoptive parents and carers in supporting young people. PCA families has zero tolerance of child abuse. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay respect to elders past and present and express our intention to move together to a place of justice and partnership. Today, we're speaking about TheraPlay and probably some other matters with Dr. Aliana Gill. Dr. Aliana Gill is a registered play therapist supervisor and director of the Gill Institute for Trauma Recovery and Education. She's been on a quest to integrate trauma-informed practices with neuroscience and has studied attachment-based therapies like the Circle of Security and TheraPlay. She's been working with Dr. Bruce Perry to obtain individual certification. She also has a background in expressive therapies and I'm particularly delighted to be learning from her today. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. You're welcome. Was there anything else you wanted to tell us about yourself or your background? Well, I am bilingual, bicultural. I am originally from South America. And so we came, we immigrated to this country when I was very little. So, but Spanish was my first language. Right. And so I've learned a lot about that piece of it, that that language is my emotional language. And yes. so when I, when I experience that I'm in trouble in any way, I immediately shift to Spanish. But oh, in wow. any case, coming to this country and not knowing the language that everyone else knew yes. gave me a real appreciation for how we can communicate with others without language. And so a lot of what I do with kids is trying to do that because most of the time when kids come to therapy, they don't knock on the door, sit down and say, let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you what I'm thinking about. Yes. Um, we have to kind of invite them into uh, communicating with us in whatever way works for them. So I always say you can talk to me, yes. but we have lots of other ways that you can show me what's on your mind. And so that's why I pursued some of the expressive therapies just to give kids an alternative way of communicating because we, I think, often rely too much on language. Absolutely. And yeah, the majority of it is not what you're saying, is it? It's the other things Absolutely. are going on around you so I can definitely relate to that I grew up learning German and I pulled off some very uh very uh, amazing German plays but not really knowing what I was saying so <laughs> by watching <laughs> and learning how other people <laughs> presented the language so yeah, yeah. great uh, so there are plays a child and family therapy that many of uh, your peers advocate for. So Stephen Porges, Dan Hughes, Daniel Siegel and Bessel van der Kolk. So in essence, it is a, um, a play treatment. So how do we get families to always understand the power of play and the outcomes that are available to them, especially when you've got children with traumatic starts? You know, I always believe in my heart of hearts that the best way to really expose someone to a concept is to let them have an experience with it. Mm -hmm. And so I have found that sometimes psychoeducation or having a brochure, here's what play therapy is, it doesn't really go far enough. Um, what people need is to be able to actually have the experience. And so mm -hmm. oftentimes during intake, I will invite them into some form of play. Now it won't be fair play immediately because maybe their child isn't there and I'm just talking with them, but I might do something simple like ask them to show me, for example, um, who lives in the family. Mm -hmm. And instead of just writing down names, we're gonna pick little miniatures. And yes. these miniatures can show how you think or feel about people in the family. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. People will do something very simple like that and they immediately say, I had no idea that so much could come out this way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the experience is really important. I've also had situations where because of my uh, particular work, I have a lot of families who are mandated into treatment. So right. they come in and they're sitting there and they don't want to be there. And, you know, wow. they don't understand why. And, mm. you know, they're disagreeing with how other people view them. And so I say to them, I understand completely, you know, I have a hard time doing something someone else thinks is good for me. Mm -hmm. You know what, let's just stand up for a second. And I have a balloon here. And all I want your you and your family to do 
is just hold the balloon up in the air. And I don't say anything else. I just put the balloon up and they start trying to keep it up in the air. <laughs> and I add a second one and then I add a third one. And you can see the level of difficulty, but oh. also the level of physical movement and breathing. And suddenly their bodies are in different positions and yes. now they're excited. And so then I take the fourth balloon and the third and the second and leave them back with one. Yes. And then we sit down and I say, so what was it like to have just one balloon to hold? What uh. was it like to have four? And then what I have now is a receptive family. Yes. Because first of all, that was totally unexpected. <laughs> there was a novelty involved in it. Yes. And it also just makes people relax when they yeah. can get out of their heads and get out of these anxious expectations about what's going to happen here. So again, the experiential component is really important. And the surprise element is really important. I always describe myself as a family play therapist. Right. And what I say is that means that I may invite you to come in and do some playful activities with your child. I may invite you and your partner to come in, do activities that are playful. Um, so at any time, just expect that you might be participating. However, I'd also like to get to know your child first. And yes. so I'm going to have some opportunity to meet alone with that child. Yes. And I prefer that. I like to make some connection with the child. And yes. then we move into either dyadic work or mm -hmm. family therapy, whole family therapy work, or whatever seems to be needed and appropriate based on a really good assessment. Um, but yes. play is always a part of what we do. It just depends on the type of play. Yes. Um, uh, I just think that it often really advances some of the overall goals that you have. Great. And uh, yeah, what a great way to learn when you're having fun, right? So. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and so what are the main principles that sort of need to be followed? There would be a science behind it, I imagine. Yeah. Now, if we're talking about TheraPlay specifically, TheraPlay is always dyadic. Mm -hmm. um, so it really looks at, based on 50 years of research or more on attachment, mm -hmm. um, it looks to either establish or strengthen a secure attachment between a parent and a child. Mm -hmm. And so what they've done is really kind of studied what are the basic elements of securely attached dyads? Mm -hmm. And then they give the parent and the child opportunities to go back and maybe um, do these activities that are intuitive in parents sometimes and other times have to be encouraged in parents. Mm -hmm. So the thing about TheraPlay that's so great is it treats the relationship. So it's not like the child who needs to get fixed in any way. It's yes. the relationship that almost always can be strengthened. No yes. matter how good the relationship might be, there are areas that you can really buffer up. Okay. And yes. most of the time when children have been adopted or there's been kinship or permanent care situations, children have had different experiences with other caretakers. Right. And so oftentimes, unless they're adopted really as babies, but even then they've been carried in a womb that's had, you know, different kinds of experiences going on and that can affect children. But a lot of times we have histories of trauma and losses and disruptions in attachment. And so a lot of times the children come in with expectations mm -hmm. of, it's going to be great to be with a parent or I'm scared of that person. And why is that person getting close to me? And mm. not that that's even a conscious process. It's something that the body learns yes. about the safety of being with another person. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what TheraPlay is designed to do is to allow children to have these experiences that are rewarding and that are dynamic and physical and nurturing and playful. Mm -hmm all the while doing it repeatedly so that the child really can begin to trust that, oh, this is actually going to be okay. Yes. Um, a lot of the, in the attachment world, they talk about the child's internal working model. Mm -hmm. And all that means is that based on whatever experiences the child has had, they develop an expectation that the world is going to be rewarding and going to take care of them or the world is kind of threatening and dangerous. And 
I think the most insidious lesson of child abuse is that people who love you hurt you. Yes. And so the other expectation is Boy. that if you start, if a child starts feeling loved and attended right away, their anxiety increases because they think that is accompanied always by, mm. you know, the next, the, the other, what's that expression? The other shoe dropping, whatever that expression is, but that yeah. it's going to be accompanied by something painful. Yes. And so it, it's a very, um, difficult situation because of course for parents we're we're trying to do intuitively the most loving nurturing thing we can do it and that's the very thing that sometimes can really make children frightened because they're just not familiar enough with it yes and one of the things i notice a lot with with uh, families where there's been adoption is sometimes the timing of things is really important for people to understand that, you know, you, you can have a child for a year and let's say that you adopted the child at six yes, and now you yes. have the child for a year and you're going, but it's been a whole year that he's been safe and loved and we're having, you know, really good experiences. Why do they continue A, B, or C? Well, a year is really a drop in the bucket. Mm in terms of experience or sufficient experience to reverse um, what's happened earlier. Yes. And so one of the biggest, I think, um, comments that I can make is patience is so important working with children with trauma histories because we have to really repeat and repeat and repeat mm -hmm. and repeat and not get tired of repeating something because that's the only way that the children are going to build um, new connections in their brain and they're going to make new associations and expectations are going to change. Yes. And sometimes I think parents get frustrated because oh, yes. they feel they're doing, you know, they're working overtime to make the child feel safer. And yet the child is still a little bit uncertain and ambivalent and they like to test limits. Yes. So there's so much work that can be done. And these are very resilient children for the most part. And oftentimes they really want to trust the other person. So that's the thing that's so surprising is even after, you know, let's say five or six or seven disruptions in foster care, mm. that child still goes into a new home with a, an expectation or a hope that something will feel different there. Yes. So I do think they're very resilient and they want to have the connection, but that connection is very anxiety provoking at times. Yes. And so they need a lot of reassurance and a lot of repetition. Yes. And so one yes. of the things I learned the most from Bruce Perry is how important repetition is. And he says, we can do therapy once a week or twice a week, but if a parent takes a child and rocks them in place 10 minutes every night, mm. that 10 minutes every night is going to go a whole lot farther Further. than any kind of therapy situation that you can put a child in. So yeah. oftentimes parents when they really see how much they're needed by the child, yes. when they really recognize that these are not rejections, but they're questions, mm. or that they are these deeply seated um, lessons that they've learned from their life experiences, if they can depersonalize it that way, I think then they can begin shifting a little bit and just saying, yeah, this is just going to take a lot longer than I thought. Mm. And I'm just going to be that steady person who repeats and repeats and repeats. Okay. And believe me, it's tiresome. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and people get really worn out because you think, how much more do I need to do? Yes. And then at some point, the child shifts yes. and something happens internally that allows them to feel safe in their yes. bodies, in their hearts, in their minds, in their souls. And, and the connection is finally strengthened enough that it feels like an anchored connection. Connection. Yeah. And I think that's why we talk so often to our families about that self-care aspect, oh, because God. it does take so long. So it's important to get that kind of time out and that, that help for self-care. You Absolutely. know, when you get to those peaks, when you are fe feeling like, you know, oh, it's exhausting. So yeah, yeah. And, the, and the depersonalizing this, that it isn't yes. you as a person that the child may be pushing away. 
it's whatever unsafe feeling they have at that moment that they yes. want to stop. Yes. And so understanding or, or viewing the behavior with different lenses, I think, is important. important. Yes. Uh, well, you've given me a new lens. I've never thought about that concept that the people that love you hurt you. And it's so true. <laughs> it's so true. And, you know, in therapy, for example, I was working with a little girl and she had been very seriously physically abused for years and years. And we had worked maybe six months, I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, not at the end, but during that time, she brings me a ping pong paddle. And I looked at her and I said, what's that? And she said, it's a ping pong paddle. And I said, oh, okay, what's it for? And she says, it's for you to hit me. Oh. And I looked at her and I said, now, why would I want to hit you? And she said, well, you like me, don't you? And it was very clear in her mind now that she felt that I really did like her and was happy to see her, that the next thing that was going to happen is mm -hmm. I was going to do something bad to her. Uh, and so we had to kind of say, uh, and, and this became a repetitive mantra, I am not going to hit you or hurt you in any way. Mm -hmm. But I can see sometimes that you've learned that when somebody loves you, that comes with it. Mm -hmm. In this case, no. Mm. That's not going to be part of my liking you. Mm. And so it took another six months for that child to really feel that no matter what she did, I was not going to hit or hurt her. And I did have to set limits because sometimes she would throw things at me or something like that. And I'd just say, you know, that's just not safe for either of us. Yes. So we're going to have to come over here and sit down and just kind of calm down a little bit uh, before we can return to uh, trying to play ball or doing something, but in a safe way. Yeah. So that lesson, wow, uh, another child came in and she'd been sexually abused by a woman, by mm -hmm. an aunt. Oh. And we went into the first appointment and she took her underwear off and she spread her legs. Oh, wow. And I said, you know, in those moments, you say to yourself, oh, my goodness, what do I do? Yes. And nobody ever taught me anything about no. this kind of behavior. And I, just <laughs> her and I said, you know, this is a place where I keep my underwear on. And you keep your underwear on. Mm. So let's put the underwear back on. And mm. I just gave it to her and she just put it right back on. But that behavior was so important because she was showing me from the get-go that this is not a safe place for me. And chances are, this is what you're going to do. So let's get it over with. Wow. And so kids somehow take a little bit of that opportunity to master something by being the one that controls. It's like, here's the ping pong racket for you to okay. hit me. Yes. So a, a little bit, it's saying, I don't want to be worried about when you're going to do this. So let's just, I'm going to, and it's not conscious. It's not like they're yes. thinking it out, but somehow that's what ends up happening. So in oh. foster care, the kids will go in. Sometimes if they've been sexually abused, they touch siblings or parents in a way that's inappropriate. But what they're doing is testing, is this a safe world for me? Mm. Because now they're saying we're your parents or we're your brothers or we're a family. Well, families usually do this stuff. So mm. let me check out if that's going to be part of what's going on. I always say to the parents that this is a great opportunity for this child to finally learn that some people will say, no, that's not appropriate. I can mm. see that you're wanting to say hello or you want to be close to me. I'll show you different ways we can do that. But touching private parts is not part of that. Yeah. And you just have to say that, you know, sometimes over and over and over. And eventually the child can begin to relax. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. I guess it's a way of them having some control over their environment as well. Right. So well, that's what I think. I think it's a it shows a child who's saying, you know, let's let's get this part over with. And let's move on to something that's not going to be so painful or so confusing for me. Yeah. So again, looking at these behaviors as suggesting something more than just being, quote, inappropriate. Mm. You know, it's not a child that's going to have this behavior forever. That's the other thing when working with adoptive parents, I always say this is not a permanent behavior. Yes. But it's going to be a temporary kind of checking out of limits until yes. the child feels like they, okay, I can relax. That's really not going to happen here. Yes, absolutely. So, so you know, um, 
Yeah, absolutely. I find practical examples of the play and responses are um, really, really helpful in understanding where it might make the, the difference for families. So do you have a few examples that you can talk to of where therapy sure. has made a difference? Yes, and I do think that one of the, now this is moving a little bit away from therapy, which is so much more pers interpersonal and kind of playful between a parent and a child, and they do mm -hmm. lots of activities. But when you're doing play therapy, mm -hmm. often we have toys. And those toys are there to help the child communicate without language, without verbal language. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, a little four-year-old child comes in and she's observing domestic violence at home. Mm -hmm. And she comes in and of course she knows why she's there because daddy hits mommy and, and I may have said something to her like I understand this has been happening and I'm sorry about that. This is a, this is a place for you to kind of look around and explore and do the things that you want to do and from time to time I'm going to bring in activities for us to play with. However, you, you know, therapists might explain that to kids, then the idea is just look around and see what you find. That four-year-old found the dollhouse and right away she put the mommy under the bed. Oh, wow. And it was and it was a little bear. So there was a daddy bear, a mommy bear, and then two baby bears. Mm -hmm. And the other baby bear was in a crib and the baby was crying. Okay. And then mother was under the bed. And then the little girl was trying to lock the door so that the dad could get in. Right. And what happens in that situation of play is that if I had said to the child directly, how do you feel about your dad hitting your mom? Or what's it like to see your mom getting hurt? Chances are the child will go, I don't know. Or they just won't. They just won't. I mean, they're little. They don't mm -hmm. have the language. Mm -hmm. However, what happens with toys is that they get to find something that becomes a symbol and it gives them the quote, safe enough distance. Yes. So my daddy's not mean and hurting, but the daddy bear, that daddy bear is hurting the mommy oh. and that baby is crying and she's scared. And the mommy, the mommy's hiding from the daddy bear because he's going to come in and find her. And mm -hmm. so they make up this whole story, which is their story, but it's being done, quote, at a safe enough distance. And now I can say, oh, what's it like for that little baby to be crying and crying? I wonder what the baby wants to say, or I wonder what could help the baby. And you just kind of do the therapy in the context of that play. Right. Yes. So it's really lovely to watch because I think that it's a way that, you know, I remember being little, for example, and I was in South America where we have lots of uh, earthquakes. Yes. So I was very terrified of earthquakes, but I found that after the earthquakes, I would, I invented a little dance called the shimmy dance. <laughs> I would say, I'm going to shake the way the house shakes. And then I would just do my body like that and people would laugh and everybody was together and suddenly we weren't so frightened anymore. Yes. But that's just completely intuitive and children have this ability to be able to externalize some of the things that are going on mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you there were a bunch of play therapists that went to Haiti, I think, after a tsunami. Yes. And it was amazing to watch that the, all the little kids they went around and through the rubble collected like little cans and things, and they built a village in the sand. Oh, wow. And that was completely spontaneous. Yes. But that constructive task is actually very reparative yes. because you can't do anything. The rubble is there and the destruction has occurred, but personally you can reconstruct something and that gives children a sense of mastery. Um, a little a boy eight years old whose parents were divorcing and he was very stressed, distressed about that. Mm -hmm. He took a toilet paper and he just wrapped the mother and father figure together with a whole thing of toilet paper mm -hmm. so they couldn't get out of there. Oh, wow. And so does that change their divorcing? No. However, it gives him a sense that in his imagination, in his pretend world, he can keep them safely huddled and cuddled together, together. Yes. Um, during this very distressing time. And so for whatever reason, that causes some relief for the child. 
And yes. so because we know that we know the benefits of play for problem solving and for, you know, discharging uh, feelings and for communicating and for socially interacting with others, then we say, let's give the kids an opportunity to do that, which is their first language. Yes. And then let's see if we can understand them better, see what we can respond uh, in turn that might actually create opportunities for them to come to a different understanding. And usually it's done all in metaphor. So we're right. talking about the baby bear or, you know, how to make this forest more safe for the forest animals or whatever it may be. Yeah. So that's why I love play. And art is similarly uh, very attractive to children and yes. they start drawing. And if you don't give them a task, like draw a picture of a tree mm -hmm. and you just let them do whatever is on their mind, oftentimes you get images that are really important to them. Like it could mm -hmm. be, I had one little 12 year old and what he drew was the hands holding each other mm -hmm. and he was grieving the loss of his mother and his mother had died, but in his mind, he was trying to stay connected, but that was completely spontaneous. Yes. That comes from the um, uh, right hemisphere of the brain. And it's something that helped the child and helped him feel better and more connected to the mom. And then he took that with him. In the end of the treatment I did with that child, with his adoptive family, we did an exercise where everyone picked the color and made these handprints. And the only directive was that all the fingers that everyone had to be touching someone. Oh, nice. And they made this really beautiful circle of all the fingers. And somehow for this child, that was reminiscent of this hand with his mom. Mm -hmm. And then in the, in the, as they were finishing this up, the child decided to put some shadows in the background and sure enough, the shadows were a thing, that grasping hand. Oh, wow. And I knew that and he knew that and he didn't say anything more than that, but it was just incredible to watch. Mm. So I think kids have within them this great capacity to heal themselves mm. or to know what they need or what might be helpful to them. And sometimes that's our job is to just help them find that which is helpful. Mm -hmm. And then once we know what that might be, whether it's writing or singing or listening to music or whatever all these expressive worlds provide, mm -hmm. then we can try to create opportunities for them to have more experiences like that. Absolutely. Um, you've got me reflecting on some early childhood education that I did. And I'm, I'm now kind of thinking it would be nice to get more insight into those other things to look for in the, the play teaching that w that I was taught so things might have changed since then I don't know so because <laughs> uh, obviously what you're talking about is there's so much more that we can be looking for in in those moments so I yeah. believe that that's yeah. true yeah um so obviously um you know any sort of therapy for children from trauma obviously involves a fair amount of time and often families can be after a bit of a quick fix with any therapy so does uh, this sort of therapy offer that kind of quick win at times? You know, it's interesting. I do think that you have almost like um, waves of progress. You know, like <laughs> I think, for example, with TheraPlay, because TheraPlay is really about the relationship and it's mm -hmm. about giving pa the parent and the child an opportunity to do sweet things with each other that mm -hmm. maybe they don't ordinarily do or don't have the time to do. Mm -hmm. But I mean, really everything about TheraPlay is so simple, deceptively simple. Um, <laughs> for example, taking a cotton ball and blowing it from your hands into the child's hands and then the child blowing it back. Mm -hmm. It's such a simple little thing. And yet a lot of times parents haven't taken the time to do something like that. And so that's what I value so much about TheraPlay is it's simple. Anyone can do it. And it takes a little encouragement because sometimes the parent may not feel comfortable mm -hmm. and sometimes the child may not feel comfortable. So it's like laying down little steps towards each other. Yes. And that works really, really well. So I can do 12 sessions of TheraPlay and see tremendous progress yes. in that triad. I mean, we've had situations where all of us in our office notice a parent that's particularly harsh with a child in the waiting room. Mm -hmm. You do a period of therapy 
and you go out and you see the parent now holding the child in her lap, reading a book. Wow. And it's like night and day. Yeah. Yeah. And they are both now motivated towards each other and they're having rewarding experiences with each other. Yes. So you can implement some therapies and see really quick results. Yes. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you stop there. You keep trying to deepen that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes people come back to therapy. I've seen this happen with equine therapy or animals therapy that the kids it really makes a huge difference in their central nervous system just in terms of how they are experiencing themselves differently Mm -hmm. Um, I have moments with kids where the play is incredible and they're making real strides in their own reflection whether they tell me or, or not their behavior changes yes and then there are periods where it just looks like nothing is going on yes and So kids pace themselves is what I want to say. Mm. Um, So I do think there are periods where there can be some really good changes. And that's usually when parents say, okay, well, they're ready to go now. And I always go, oh, no, we're just starting. (laughs) But that's okay. Go and then they can come back and we can do another layer of the work if they want to do it that way. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. So it is time consuming, but yes, I also think that it can be there can be progress in very specific areas. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to add one more thing. This Mm -hmm. training I did with Bruce Perry, Mm -hmm. the most important thing about that is that all the therapies that we've designed work. Yes. What he says is you just have to apply them sequentially based on the child's brain and what's going on in their current life situation. So if I have a child who comes in and their anxiety doesn't let them stop walking around the room. Yes. I can't sit there and do psychoeducation because their cognitive uh, ability, their prefrontal cortex is not online. Mm-hmm. So I may have to do something like blowing balloons or, you know, I don't know, anything that maybe has the body involved and can begin to co regulate them. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes it's simple stuff like just blowing a bubble and wa- letting them watch the bubble and then saying, okay, now next time I send you a bubble, see if you can pop it mm-hmm. and pop it with your hands. And next time pop it with your elbow and pop it with your head. And then the <laughs> physiology of the child changes. Yes. Once that happens, then yes, you can think about the cognitive behavioral work, which is also so useful. It's just, that's not usually my starting place. Because yes. I want the other parts to sort of be in a different place. And the other parts, meaning the child's sense of safety and trust, comfort, um, availability, emotional availability. Because I do see kids who can tell you exactly what you want to hear. Mm-hmm. They're kind of therapy savvy. Mm-hmm. You know, they come in and they kind of know what to say to get out of there as soon as they can. Um, <laughs> so I really want the time to kind of get to know the child. And then I can kind of look at, here's what I think will work with this child versus this child versus this family and so forth and so on. Great. And do families do homework? What sort of things do they do that, that help Absolutely. the process? <laughs> Absolutely. And so behind the scenes, I'm coaching yes. and I'm doing some coaching design to give the parents some ideas and it, I may give them simple fair play activities to do at home. I might say to them, you know, this place, I want you to come in and I want you to watch what it looks like to do child-centered play therapy. Mm-hmm. And then they come in and they watch. And then I say, okay, so now ne- at home, what I want you to do is practice doing some child-centered play therapy. And I'll give them a quick instruction. And that's actually called filial therapy. And mm-hmm. that's when you're having the parent actually use the basic principles of play therapy, which is empathic listening, unconditional witnessing, no demands or expectations, but just being there with the child. Mm-hmm. And that goes a very long way. So there's mm-hmm. always stuff going on. And if a child has an insight and they figure out, wow, when I feel this, I do this. I'll say, you know, sometime this week, I'd love for you to share that information with your parents. Mm -hmm. See if you can teach them what you learned about that. Mm -hmm. And so they might go home and try to teach that to their family. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's all about the the homework piece. You definitely want to keep that 
translating back to the family. It's not just about what's happening in the play therapy office. Yeah, absolutely. So, and where should families go if they want to find a TheraPlay therapist or to learn more about TheraPlay? What, what's... Sure. Um, there is a website. It's just www.theraplay.org. Mm-hmm. And that's where all their materials are. And there's a lot of beautiful resources and, you know, there's definitely a list of providers all across the United States and internationally as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a great place to go. And then in terms of general play therapy, you can go to the association for play therapy and that's a four, the number four pt.org. Okay. And so both of those websites have a tremendous amount of information and you know, there's lots of people now really providing a lot of good help. Mm-hmm. A lot of parents don't like to sift through and read Correct. materials. So, yes. <laughs> no, that's why for me, I like the personal component yes. of it. I like people to come in yes. and let me show you and show you what I do. I sometimes invite uh, moms or dads or anyone to do a, um, a sand tray. Yes. I just say you can just look around and use as few as many little objects as you want and just build a world in the sand. Yes. And most of the time they're just shocked yes. by how much comes forward in that process. And, and it's, they're surprised personally, like, wow, this, this tells me this. And I thought I was way over that or whatever it may be. <laughs> so again, I just think the experience often is the most profound way to learn the potential benefit of, of play therapy or any expressive therapies, dance, movement, music, drama, yes. uh, art, you know, yes. all of those are incredible. And they seem to be um, something very, that resonates with kids a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we keep growing up, sometimes we forget that we do that too. So inviting adults back into play is yes. often kind of a remarkable experience for them. I had a dad who was like six foot five and he made a picture (laughs) as he was leaving. He went, can you believe that I did something that beautiful? (laughs) I didn't know I was such a good artist. And it was so great. He was just so full of pride. Yeah. And really that I didn't know I could do stuff like this. I'm going to try to do some more. And so then the boy and the dad started doing scribble drawings together. And, you know, we gave them all kinds of things they could actually do together and they had a blast and felt closer to each other. Yeah. And sometimes people just need permission to, to do something too, don't they? So yeah, explore something new. Um, Is there anything else that you wanted to comment on or provide insight on? today? You know, um, I, I think I've said most of what I think is important. I will just end with the notion that Dr. Porges says, and that is, he says, safety is the treatment for the child. Mm -hmm. And so that everything that we do and how we orient about problem solving should include an element of how do we make the child feel safe? And when the child feels safe, you'll see it right away because their whole body changes, their eye, their gaze changes, their their full smile becomes more ample. Um, But a lot of kids are walking around just in a body that doesn't feel safe to them yet. And so I think that's one of the most valuable contributions uh, that Dr. Porges has made talking about just that whole sense of your body has sort of an alarm system Um, that tells you where it's safe and where it's dangerous. And unfortunately, kids with histories of trauma, that alarm system kind of trips off more often than not, Mm -hmm. because they haven't developed that secure attachment in order for them to feel safe. There's a huge connection between that. When kids start feeling securely attached, Mm -hmm. they can relax into themselves and they can feel uh, more secure and more connected to someone else. So the connection piece is really, really important. So important. So, and it makes sense. Logically, it absolutely makes sense, doesn't it? So, yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. I feel like I've personally learnt a lot from chatting to you and it's good to be reminded of those messages around it takes a long time and connection and and regulation. So, and patience. And patience. (laughs) Absolutely. So, it was a pleasure to be with you.
Uh, thank you. And, and, and um, everyone listening, thank you so much. Yes. And to anyone listening, thank you for giving up your valuable time for the benefit of the young people in your life. And until next time, have an amazing week. Okay, great. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Bye.